Hi everybody, welcome back. In this video, we will learn how to calculate the Gibbs free energy for a reaction, uh, for a stepwise reaction. And so the same rules apply like you learned back in first general chemistry in your first semester um, for enthalpy using Hassel's law. So for example, if a chemical equation is multiplied by some factor, that Gibbs free energy is also multiplied by the same factor. If you need to reverse a chemical equation, then the Gibbs free energy for that reaction changes the sign from positive to negative or from negative to positive. And if a chemical equation can be expressed as the sum of a series of steps, then the Gibbs free energy for the reaction of the overall equation is the sum of the free energies of reactions for each step. Okay, so same rules like you learned with Hess's law. Now, please, please be careful. Um, the rules are different if you're looking at an equilibrium constant. And in my previous videos, when I discussed you know, equilibrium constants and manipulating reactions and then having to manipulate the equilibrium constant, I reminded you that the rules were different for the equilibrium constant. So if you're taking my course and you're taking my final assessment, it is cumulative, make sure that you distinguish the rules for Gibbs free energy and enthalpy for a stepwise reaction versus equilibrium constant for stepwise reactions, okay? Okay, let's do an example together. So calculate the Gibbs free energy for the reaction below, the decomposition of calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. We have two reactions here with their individual Gibbs free energies. And so what I always like to do is I like to find kind of the common um, chemical or compounds. So for the first one, I see that I have calcium carbonate here and here. I want this reaction to look like this reaction. I notice that calcium carbonate is on the product side of the arrow and the reaction I desire is on the reactant side. So what do I need to do to this reaction to make it look more like this? Excellent. I need to reverse it. which means what am I going to do to the sign of the Gibbs free energy? Excellent, I'm going to make it positive. Good, so I'm gonna to have to change it to positive once it's reversed. So let's go ahead and write that down. So we have calcium carbonate. I'm reversing the reaction because eventually I'll need to add it up. And there we go. And the delta G of this reaction now is equal to a positive 734.4 now that we've reversed it kilojoules. All right, I then look at the second one and I'm like, okay, what is common between this reaction here below with this one here? Right, I see calcium oxide, so I'm gonna highlight that and then I can look at it here. Okay, so the first thing I always check is it in the correct side of the arrow, and it is. Both are products. Next, I check what the stoichiometric coefficients are. It's two here, but I want it to be one here. So what do I need to multiply this reaction by so that I get one mole of calcium oxide? Excellent. I need to multiply by one half. So you multiply by one half. And in that case there, I end up with calcium plus one half oxygen. I didn't need to reverse it, I'm keeping those on the reactant side to give me calcium oxide. If you have to multiply by one half, what do you do to the Gibbs free energy? 
excellent. You also multiply by one half. You multiply it by the same factor. And so for this one, the Gibbs free energy of the reaction is equal to negative 603.3 kilojoules per mole of this reaction. All right, then let's go ahead and add them up and see what we get overall. See if it looks like the overall reaction that we had one in. In the first place. Okay, so you cross out like terms on opposite sides of the arrow, so it looks like calcium would ca um, cancel out because it's on the product side of the first reaction, on the reactant side on the second reaction. It also looks like this one half oxygen cancels out. So you write what's left over. We have calcium carbonate plus, well actually nothing else for that, we're decomposing it, right? And it looks like it's creating calcium oxide plus the carbon dioxide gas. So it definitely looks like it matches the equation that we were going for. So we manipulated these other equations correctly and then we had to add them up and so when you need to add up equations what do you do with their Gibbs free energies you sum them up as well so the Gibbs free energy for the reaction in green <laughs> the overall reaction is equal to the Gibbs free energy for the first one, so 734.4 kilojoules, plus the Gibbs free energy for the second one, which is negative 603.3 kilojoules. And that gives you a plus 131.1 .1 kilojoules per mole. So from here, we've determined that the decomposition of calcium carbonate here, which I need to fix that <laughs> real quick. There we go. <laughs> so calcium carbonate, CaCO3 solid. The decomposition, is it spontaneous or non-spontaneous? It's a positive delta G, so definitely non-spontaneous. And so the reason why, there's a couple of reasons why knowing these rules is helpful um, in the real world. In the chemistry lab, maybe you have some theoretical data for reactions, some literature data, but you don't have maybe the exact Gibbs free energy for the reaction you're studying. So you can take reactions and manipulate them such that they add up to look like the reaction you're trying to run. And using that literature data, it can help guide you to determine if the reaction will be spontaneous or not. So that's like one reason why having these rules um, and knowing them is useful. Another reason um, could be that you need to couple a reaction um, with another one that's not spontaneous to make the overall reaction spontaneous. And that's something that we see, and I discussed this in our previous videos, that like non-spontaneous reactions are not impossible. You can couple it with another reaction to make it spontaneous, or you can supply energy from an external source as well. But biology does this quite well. So we have a lot of biosynthesis reactions that occur in our body, and they create really complex biological molecules such as proteins and DNA. Those processes are non-spontaneous, but obviously they still occur, right? And the reason why they do is because they are coupled, so however coupled, so that just means it's run at the same time with the oxidation of glucose looks like this C6H12O6 is glucose we're doing the combustion reaction here right? it's 
occurring in our bodies to give carbon dioxide plus water. And the Gibbs free energy for this reaction is highly exergonic. It's negative 2,880 kilojoules per mole. Very, very spontaneous. And so that's what helps to provide the energy needed to do the work. Right? Remember the free energy is the, the available amount of energy to do work, so in this case here, to synthesize proteins and DNA, right? And so that's why glucose is so useful, and that reaction can be coupled with these reactions to make the overall process spontaneous. And so you would add up their Gibbs free energy, and like I said, this is so large that it helps to overcompensate what we would call the endergonic reactions, the, the non-spontaneous reactions of the biosynthesis of large biological molecules. So I just wanted to give you that kind of application to understand like why this is useful to, to know and to be able to practice with. All right, so make sure you review over the rules. Once again, identify the rules for Gibbs free energy and enthalpy. Remember Hess's Law, review over those notes from first semester general chemistry or look back in the textbook um, for those rules, which are the same basically. And then compare that to what we learned when we discussed equilibrium constant um, together and that those rules are different, okay? So when you do come up to your cumulative assessment, they're distinguished in your mind and you don't get confused, all right? Well, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.